Domain? RCT? Maybe something new. Let's see. What's up guys, hello Pumps here, and we all do a breakdown and review for chapter 255 of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is known as the Decisive Battle in the Uninhabited Demon Fest in Jinjuku Part 27, featuring Miguel and Friends. And honestly, I really, 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 really like this chapter. It has a bunch of different aspects of it that I enjoy and I'm excited to talk about, but since I know I will be yapping for a minute and a half, let's not waste any more time and let's hop right into it. Editing me, ready, three, two, one, go. Ooh, what's up guys, that guy with a pencil here, fun fact, I do happen to have it on me and keep it on me at all times, and another fun fact, I still don't know how, ah, this, it's, it bothers me, it does bother me, cause, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, well, I know, really weird tangent, what, what bothers you, pencil, in this chapter that you supposedly really, really like, have, have you lied, have you deceived us, have you bamboozled us, and then I say, not necessarily, what Sugita says here is, <clears throat> Hmm. Saving that teleporting boy must be the work of one of their techniques. I don't know which one. That, 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 that's the thing. I read the chapter. I did the live reaction, which you can check it over on Patreon for as little as one dollar month. Or you can remember for as little as three dollars a month to check it out. It's 38 minutes long. I think in the short review I said it was 36 minutes. I did not realize that bad boy was 38 minutes long. Golly. I do be yapping. But with that being the case, I noticed this there. Peep through the comment section on a couple of different discussions. I, I, know, I don't know. What, what technique was it? Because, I mean, like, Miguel was holding him, then he let him down. But, like, did, was it legit just Miguel, like, low-key perception blitzing Tsukuna? Because unless Leroux can spawn multiple of the heart catch hands, I don't know how Uyui got saved. And very specifically ended up in Miguel's arms. Because we know Miguel's technique now. It's the Hakuna Lana. So, like, there's... I don't think that would allow him to just grab Uyui. Like, I don't... I don't fully understand how Uyui was saved, and considering he kind of is the facilitator for the entire arc at this point, I do kind of wish Gage was a bit more explicit, but it's probably there staring at me dead in the face and laughing at me. So, honestly, I can't really knock it all too much. But, with it being the case, we see that Ryoben Tsukuna couldn't get him. He could not get Uyui. And now, this is very, very important. Because remember, like I mentioned, Uyui is the facilitator. For the entire arc as we know it. He's the reason Takaba managed to show up and take care of Kenjaku alongside Yuda. He's the reason Yuda was able to get back to the battlefield so quickly. He's likely the reason for... I mean, there's a 50-50 shot on whether it's Maki's own regeneration because of the time that's passed. Or Uyui taking him back to Shoko and Shoko healing up Maki. Uyui's the reason why Gojo Santoru's body is on the battlefield. It's why Hikuruma Hiromi's body is on the battlefield. It's why Kashima Hajime's pieces are likely no longer on the battlefield. Uyui has kind of been... Backpack in the whole arc. So his survival is very, very important. So his survival is fantastic. Very, very important thing to note. And I'm interested to see what kind of role he plays now, especially considering the only people he has hypothetically to bring back to the battlefield are Yuta Kotsu when he finally, you know, calling Kingdom Hearts because he needs to reconnect. And or possibly Hikaruma, maybe still, I don't, I don't know. With Hikaruma being gone for as long as he has, and the depth of his wounds, and the vanishing of his curse technique, I highly doubt Bro could come back and get a whole other trial set up, and Tsukuna would play along as nicely this time, so I'm not sure Hikaruma's coming back. I, I've heard people looking for it, because like, oh, he's still alive, he can bring him back, you know, resurrection, I'm kind of fine with, uh, you know, a certain someone, Hikaruma, Hikaruma being gone. A lot of people are... Especially with a certain volume extra sketch for 26, a lot of people are theorizing Gojo's return, which finally has given me enough reason to finally talk about the concept proper, which I will do in a separate video, but we always not need it for that. Gojo would just teleport back himself. I know people are like, well, Gojo can't teleport that easily. He literally teleported from the bottom of an ocean on the entire other side of the country to Kenjaku in a matter of two seconds. He could teleport back. But with that being the case, Uyui's alive. Next person who's alive, Kusakabe. I, I, mm, here's the thing. People point it out, and you're absolutely right, Sukuna very likely used Kusakabe as bait. Like, I'll leave him just alive enough. He hit him with... He slashed him across the chest just like that to let the wounds be deep enough that Kusakabe had to... Oh, sweet mother of mercy. Plus, Kusakabe probably realizing, wait a second, I'm going to be used as bait. Let me at least be good bait. Oh, sweet mother of mercy. And on top of that... <laughs> It's Kusakabe being alive. That's very, very good. Ultimately, I will admit I was kind of scared for Bro getting one tap wondered, and with him not appearing at the end of 254, I was definitely worried for his well being. I thought they had possibly gotten my boyo. However, my boyo is alive and well, which is 
Hallelujah. But also, that means Kusakabe likely left with Uyui, considering we do not see Kusakabe's body later on in this chapter, and it's very likely that Uyui also just vanishes with him. Meaning Kusakabe could show back up on the battlefield, which would allow us to leap to six Avengers? Maybe still at five, depending on what happens to the LaRue election. LaRue! English. LaRue next chapter. Speaking of LaRue, LaRue is here! Neat. I don't... Well, no, not necessarily I don't care. It's interesting, though. Notably, I, I've i been kind of memeing myself about how Gage is just raging into the bag. But at this point, once again, I thought Miguel opened doors. Lou opened doors. Essentially, think of any character who's confirmed to be alive or not confirmed to be cooked. I know this is big. LaRue showing up is very, very big for two types of fans. It's the Nobora... Cobras, and the Toto Toe Tasters. Now, both, I, I'm not going to say impossible to return, and I'm leaning more towards Toto. Once again, Nobara kind of had, now here's the thing though, I guess I should, I should talk about a hypothetical Nobara return properly in another video. I kind of glazed over it in one kind of Nobara-esque video, but I didn't really go properly in depth with it, so I probably should, but Nobara, I, I don't think she'd be able to up. And I don't think her being able to keep up would be good, but at the same time, Sugan is holding back, so Nobara coming back, eh, not leaning towards it. Toto also, once again, his, as he says himself, his technique is cooked, so I wouldn't really want Toto to come back just to get got, because I assume all he would. But this does leave the door open for characters like Uro to come back, and this does leave the door open for, that's it. I literally can't think of any other characters. Because honestly, if you had asked me at the end of 254 who else was left to come back, I would give you Toto, Nobara, and Uro, and then run out. LaRue would have not even crossed my mind. So, I'll I'll just leave it at that. LaRue's here, and that opens the door for anyone else. And once again, there's still the high possibility of just random sorcerers showing up. The fact that nobody has at this point is actually kind of interesting. They all, well, I guess maybe because they just can't sense it or, like, would not show up anyway. But, I mean, this is kind of the rerun of the Heian era. This is the time to drop Ryo Mitsukuna. But, with that being the case, we see the narrator declare, Team Ghetto come to save the day. Miguel and even LaRue enter the fray. Ooh! Ooh! JJK narrator! Hold on a second! How did I not notice that? Bucko! You, you, you look at me! I didn't know you had bars. What you what you what you, what you get with bars for? Enter the fray. Wait wait wait. Hold on. Let me let me hit that. Save the day. Miguel and even Larue enter the fray. I didn't know never you had all that to say. Come on now, don't play. Get up in there. Oh hey. Okay, I see you. I see you. I get hyped over the stupidest things. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Probably a bit of both. But with that being the case, Miguel, Miguel, Miguel. Quite the character, as we'll see. Because we get a nice little flashback. Once again, it's interesting that Gege has just, like, seemingly completely given up on, like, the flashback formula where you, like, turn the panels black. Because there are no black panels in this chapter, even though this very clearly takes place in the one, one month time skip from the past. But we have Miguel back in his home country, sitting on a very familiar looking chair. At least familiar to me. But we see... <clears throat> See, I, don't, I feel bad about giving him the accent, but at the same time, because, like, it's not accurate. He's not from West Africa. I don't think he is. Hold on. Let me... I, where is Miguel from? Miguel JJK country of origin. I feel bad. I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to just give him that accent. Yeah, he's from Kenya. And that's East Africa. So, like, I... I, I will hesitate. Especially since I, I can't actually speak... Miguel's, um, what was I gonna say? I can't actually speak in the way that Miguel does with that accent that I gave him because I don't say those words in that accent ever. So <laughs> we're, we're gonna try. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. No way. Fight an opponent that may be able to defeat Gojo Satoru. That's beyond the realm of monsters. How do you expect me to do something like that? So, I mean, I guess I can kind of do it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I mean, I've been debating back and forth. Because, like, I know all three of my Kenyan viewers are like, dude, that's not a Kenyan accent. And you're right. You're right. And besides, they're supposed to be speaking Japanese anyway. So, realistically, all this is wrong. But with that being the case, I mentioned it before. I'll mention it again. Yeah. Yeah, like, like, be real with me. Be real with me. Even if you knew this was your opportunity to, are you, 
Are you really gonna go run smoke? Hop on the opportunity to run smoke with Ryom and Tsukuna? Like, especially if... Because this, this is like... This is a multi-layered scenario here. Like, this is like hearing about a guy who could beat the guy that beat you up for like an hour straight. Like, like you want me to come fight the stronger guy after I couldn't beat the weaker guy. Like, like, I don't blame Miguel's thought process here. And it does make sense. However, I'll admit both sides make sense. I was, I was a little bit harsh to the sorcerer side because I was like, yeah, wait, wait, what y'all, what y'all mean? What y'all cooking? But at the same time, I can kind of understand what they mean and what they're cooking because, yeah, yeah, get Miguel. If, if he can cook and you know he can cook considering what he did against Gojo Satoru, get him to cook. And we see that it was LaRue and Yuta who came specifically to... Try and convince Miguel to come join them. As LaRue says, Miguel John, that crazy monster is going to be all tuckered out from fighting Gojo Santoru. They only want you to lend a hand in finishing it off. But I guess technically saving Megami is finishing Sukuna off, but that'd be one of my main stipulations. We are not sparing anybody. If we can off, bro, we're offing him. I'm, I'm That's one of my main stipulations before we pull to the battlefield. I'm sorry. If Gojo Santoru fell to this man, we're going for next man's head. We're not playing games. You know what I'm talking about? We are going for it. A hundred million billion a million to a decillion percent. So that's still crazy. I still... But then again, this is pre-month time skip. They don't know if Gojo's actually going to fall. They have contingency plans set up. So maybe that, you wouldn't plan for that, especially. I mean, you'd plan for it, but you wouldn't plan for it. And you wouldn't, like, bring that up as a terms and conditions type thing. Like, I will only help if I will not get in trouble or have to fight Shu all for executing Ryo Minsukuna, even if he's in the bottom of Megami Fushiguro. Because once again, that's the th funny thing about this. We don't know just about how much they explained the situation to Miguel. Like... He wasn't even in the combat room, or at least the viewing room, for the Gojo vs. Tsukuna battles. We actually have no idea where Bro came from, or like where he was chilling at while the whole battle was going on, how the whole debacle with Megami would go in Miguel's head. Because remember, he never met Megami, just like Tsukuna never met Miguel, or Megami never met Miguel. This is in Law of Clone Exchange. Ghetto's family, due to being regulated to JJK Zero, kind of like locks them off from a lot of the main narrative. And typically, whenever they do appear in the main narrative, it's to get got, or like as a loose reference. And the two ideas that I reference there are Nanako and Mimiko getting got by Sukuna. And the loose reference is the two sorcerers that Panda and Kuzakabe were facing off with when Jogo dropped Maximum Meteor. Considering they don't show up in this chapter, I'm assuming they got hit by Maximum Meteor, which is kind of embarrassing. Because Panda was able to dodge Maximum Meteor. Panda was able to dodge Maximum Meteor. <laughs> But that aside, I do kind of wish we got them all back, because what's the point of only bringing some of them? But at the same time, I get it. You can't really overflow the battlefield with characters and nonsense. Really considering you'd have to create curse techniques on the fly, because even in the Zero Extension movie, I don't think either of those two characters got curse techniques. They kind of disappeared. But with that being the case, we see that Miguel's like... Tucker out? <laughs> Hold on, let, let, me, let me hit it real quick, real proper. As if the stated reach will be something as cutesy as tuckered out. What do you mean tuckered out? Do you think he's going to need a nap? Do you think he needs a little meal? Do you think he needs a bottle? That he's going to come here to us after he's beating the brakes of the Satoru Gojo. Likely it's a black flash or two. He's going to come in. He's going to be all calm and tired and sleepy. Do you think we can come deal with him nice and easy? What do you think this is? Who do you think he is? This is the king of castles you're speaking of. A man capable of slaughtering Satoru Gojo. I do not want to smoke. And hey, I don't want to smoke either. But with that being the case, we see... <laughs> that ultimately Miguel kind of gets completely ignored here, at least in his point, where Lou just says, hmm, you've sure gotten good at Japanese. Impressive vocals, or impressive vocab. Which, yeah. As a person who struggled to learn multiple languages in the past and just has completely forgotten the one second language I got any sort of grasp over, cuando usar español yo no te... See, look, I, that is completely wrong. I spoke horribly incorrect. Yo no tengo una comprensión de español después muchos años de no usar. <laughs> I barely, I can barely speak Spanish because I haven't used it properly in years. Like, you can catch me five years past though. I could have spoke. I could have held my own. I went to a whole country. But with that being the case, 
It's neat. It is neat. It's one of the more impressive things to do is not just knowing your grammar and knowing how to structure sentences, sentences, but it is actually being able to pull out different words. Like, heck, even in your native language, knowing a certain amount of words is impressive. Like, I don't know, word of the day, whatever. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Obviously, that's not a real word. What's an actual long word? Agoraphobia. I actually forget what that even means. But essentially, big words are cool. And being able to use them in any language is very, very impressive. Considering languages are very, very vast. But we see that Yuda tries to rationalize with Miguel. He says, We expect the fallout of the merger between everyone in Japan and Tengen-sama won't just stop at our borders. Which is a good logical assumption. Because that's one of the bigger things that also needs to be talked about with the merger and whether or not it should be legally allowed to happen. I mean, maybe it'll be like a wild animal and it'll be provoked to stay with whoever's attacking it. Whether that be Sukuna, whether that be Yuji, whether that be Yuta, whether that be Maki, whether that be Hikari, whether that be Kusakabe. But like, for all intents and purposes, if its main goal ends up being producing more of itself, or like getting bigger or stronger, it would probably just walk away and start plaguing everything. So that's a very good point, right? Like... It isn't just Sukuna that needs to be worried about. It is the merger. And now, while those are one issue, essentially, in our current timeline, at this point, those two individually are massive threats that need to be taken in regard on their hypothetical effect, not just on Japan, but the entire world. And while, of course, Miguel is an entire supercontinent away, he's a whole Eurasia away from Japan, it doesn't mean that the merger wouldn't appear in his or his kids or his grandkids' lifetime. It probably would just... To Africa! I am just trying to eat it all. So that is a good point to bring up. However, Miguel makes a pretty bold claim, and it kind of comes down to a question I want to ask y'all. As he says... <clears throat> Even if a Godzilla-sized car spirit comes and gives its best to my homeland, that would still be preferable to fighting Sukuna. Which... I... Is it, I don't know. Like, say hypothetically, you had to pick between Ryom and Sukuna showing up and your native nation or the merger. Which one would you prefer? I, I, it really is just pick how you want to go. Because, like, if Sukuna came around... But then again, I don't know. It's hard to tell, like, just because we don't know enough about Sukuna and his previous patterns in his ancient life. Like, would he just while out randomly and, like, just start consuming random? Like, if you praised him and treated him like a deity, like they were doing in that one Yorozu flashback, would he, like, actually even bother you? Like, Kuzakabe assumes not. Kuzakabe just assumes he'd be chilling and probably, like, kidnap a random person here or there. But I don't know about Tsukuna. Meanwhile, I feel like the merger, especially based on how Tengen describes it, like, if one malicious soul gets caught up in there, it'll tox toxify the whole bunch and then... <laughs> destruction or rampant chaos and everything will recall throughout i feel like it would just indiscriminately slaughter everything and probably be so large and so powerful that there's literally nothing we could do to stop it so miguel it's a it's a bold claim but i'm not all too sure what i am sure of is the fact that i do need to take a sip There's nothing better than a sip. But with that being the case, Miguel makes this assertion. And one thing I do like, I do like about this chapter, is it feels like Gege is doing some direct and indirect apologizing through Miguel and his mentality. As Miguel brings out, <clears throat> Do you Japanese think high spirited black people will just survive anything? I'm going to have to pass. I've got to look out for my brothers. Which is very true. Once again, they say it when you're on a plane, and in general, you gotta be able to help yourself first before you can go helping anybody else. And in this case, how do you even help yourself? It's Ryom and Sukuna. Like, once again, we don't necessarily know how much of Ryom and Sukuna's hype and or lore was told to Miguel or how much of it legit just spread to Kenya and Miguel's location. But regardless... Mm, seems dangerous and devious. And obviously, Miguel appears to be the strongest of his family. So, thusly, leaving them alone just in Africa may be dangerous. We don't know how long he spent in Japan with Ghetto and his family, but it probably wasn't too extensive of a time. Meanwhile, he'd probably have to spend, like, a whole bunch of time there now in order to deal with Sukuna. But, with that being the case, 
Miguel does end up tackling the more antiquated views of Japanese people. But admittedly, that's the thing, they're the antiquated views. Meanwhile, modern views and modern sensibilities seem to be shifting at least a bit. As Yuta says, the only people that still think like that are the ones raised on cheesy American films. The ones from the 80s. Maybe a, uh, maybe a certain, um, maybe a certain, uh, Sansaru Gojo, huh? <laughs> we'll get to it, we'll get to it. But we see that <laughs> both offer their condolences in unique, but admittedly still kind of demoralizing ways, where, <laughs> where Yuna doesn't exactly say no. He, he says no for himself, but he's like, ah, other people. Meanwhile, Laru just goes on to say, I never once thought of you as jovial, hon. Which is like, I guess. So you just <laughs> you just believe they're innately more durable, huh? They don't have to be happy, but they can be more durable. And we see that y Miguel says, regardless, Gojo should be here. He's head low, pleading himself to come bring me there. To come bring me to this battlefield where I may face my end. Aren't the Japanese supposed to be polite? So I do like how he does flip the stereotype. I mean, of, of course, stereotypes are bad, just in general. Like, even, even I'd say positive, or what could be construed as positive stereotypes are bad. They can get in the way of each other. Like, assuming, oh, a certain group of people is smarter than others. Like, that can be bad for the people who just are not that way. And it's bad to assume that half the time. It's bad to make assumptions in general. You should always try... Well, not always. There are scenarios... If someone, if someone comes up to you with a pokey poke with a certain devious look in their eyes, trust your instincts and run, or, depending on who you are, put your, dog, put your, put your dukes up. But in most cases, it's proper to interpret people as people, not just a categorization of their physical appearance. Because physical appearances are pretty much irrelevant. Like, I forget, what's the percentage? Like, I swear, how, what percentage are humans alike? What genetic percentage of humans are actually different because i think it's like a really low number percentage of humans are identical let's go with that yeah yeah like based on our dna at least according to the american academy of arts and sciences 99.9 percent .9 identical Based on the examination of our DNA, any two human beings are 99.9% .9 identical. The genetic differences between different groups of humans are similarly minute. Since we still, we only have to look around to see an astonishing variety of individual differences in sizes, shapes, and facial features. So yeah, humans are mostly the same. I mean, it makes sense. We're a species for a reason. But heck, I think we're like 90% banana too. Like we're, we're very, we're very unique. But not unique in terms of like the living spectrum. Because only so many things can live. We're a combination of certain living factors. But seeing that reflected and brought up through one of the few characters in JJK who could actually address that is always interesting. I do like when JJK does decide to branch out slightly and like reveal other aspects of the world. Because hey, a lot of people have a big complaint with JJK. And it's the fact that the world, for the most part, feels rather isolated. Like... Like, there's very little interaction between the different aspects of the world. And, like, world building is always something that's put super far into the background that we never really touch on because it's just not important to the major plot. And thusly, that leaves a lot of the other nations feeling a bit empty and the lack of understanding and conflict between these nations feeling a little bit empty. So having Miguel sort of act as a focal point and a mouthpiece for the hypothetical contradictory and or dated and or negative views of other races... I like it. I like it. I like it. It's an aspect that I didn't think Gege was going to tackle, but they've tackled before in the idea of Japanese stereotypes, and, like, you see that a lot in Maki and my story as sorceresses in the Zenin family, a very old traditional clan. You see it with the whole hierarchy and importance of the elders and the disrespect for the youth, the next generation, and it's something like Hikari. So, like, yeah, there's a bunch of Heck, even with Yuta, Kotsu, and Yuji Tadori, though admittedly, maybe Yuta Kotsu should have been spared Yuji Tadori, shouldn't it? But regardless, yeah, there's a there's a lot of untapped potential within hypothetical dynamics between different groups of people and sorcerers of Japan, and just Japan in general within the world of Jutsu Kaisen. So if this is the only glimpse we get of it, good stuff. I'm glad we had it. But with that being the case, we see that Yuta's like, Getting so sick and tired of that. You know what? Fine. Should I prostrate myself? Do you want me to get on my hands and knees and beg you? Because I will. 
I'll even have Rika dig the ground lower so I can prostrate myself appropriately. I'll be tooted up, Miguel. Does that make you happy? <laughs> See, Miguel's like, oh my, oh my. Look at you being all scary. Scary boy. Come on now, Utah Kotsu. I raised you. Yeah, I would not be at the source of you all if it was not for me. Calm yourself down. Calm yourself down. And we see <laughs> that Yuta's like, I'm not even mad, though. I would never. <laughs> Miguel. Miguel. Me? Get angry. I would. I would never. Miguel. Miguel. How could you assume that of me? How could you assume? And then Yuta walks off screen and then tweaks out <laughs> and, like, wipes the whole country off the map. Because he can't tell the whole country. He's a special great sorcerer. But with that being the case, we see that LaRue is like, clearly this is not going to work. Yuta John, won't you leave us just to have a little chat? Just the two of us. Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. Just the two of us. You and I. But with that being the case, we see that LaRue just has to be alone with Miguel for a minute. And notably, they sit in silence for a second. And naturally, these two do have a deeper connection. And Miguel just asks, what are you going to do, Lauru? Throw yourself into the jaws of death and for what? Risk your life for these people who have oppressed us for what? Risk your life for the boy who took our potential king's life for what? Because that's the thing, right? Notably, they don't tackle it too much, and I don't think it'll ever be mentioned, but Yuda Kotsu, if not directly, is mostly responsible for the end of Tsukuru Geta. The man who both LaRue and Miguel believed in. So, their cordiality or hypothetical lack of animosity towards Yuta is very, very impressive on both of their ends, considering all that ghetto meant to them. And naturally, Miguel's questioning, what do you even get out of this? What's the point of doing this? What are you even planning with this? Considering all that we've lost and all we could still stand to lose by engaging this, what is your thought process? We see LaRue say, I just wanted to make Suguru-chan king the same as you. So, once again, I mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. Jujutsu Kaisen. I love it. I think definitively it probably still, I was thinking like Cheat and Count Record of Ragnarok is my favorite, but I think, is Record of Ragnarok, it's at 88 chapters now, one chapter a year, 12 eight, seven years. Maybe it can't be kept. But then again, My Academia still counts as a new gen, and I think that's been around for like 10 years. So like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe technically, yeah, I think, I think maybe you can count regular Ragnarok. But that, that aside, or, or Pico, maybe Pico, but I don't know. I, I'd have to think on that more. But JJK, most likely my favorite new gen. It has a bunch of my favorite characters, a lot of my favorite fights, a lot of my favorite abilities, a lot of discussion, a lot of fun. It's why I talk about it all the time and talk about it so in depth. But, if I had to have one issue, one problem, one thing that'll haunt me to the end of the series' days, in spite of whatever light novels, extra materials, or promotional art, whatever it would try to do, the ties and relationships between characters and their motivations have either been very simple and laid out quickly, once and never interrogated or addressed, or investigated, or they're never brought up. The idea that Miguel wanted to make Suguru chan king as... LaRue says, intriguing, why? Especially considering the general lack of connection. Tsukuru Geto is Japanese. Miguel is Kenyan. They live on, if not direct opposite sides of the world, very, very, very far apart. How did that even happen? How did Tsukuru find Miguel? How did Miguel find Tsukuru? What, not necessarily, I don't want to say like, what were the connotations for their meeting. Why did Miguel start to believe in Suguru? Why was Miguel willing to risk his life against Gojo Satoru to stall him out? Why did he do all that? What was the motivation behind it? We won't know. And we'll never know because of the way JJK is paced and because of what happened. However, one thing I'll give this duo in particular and the entire of Suguru Geto's family in particular is that they suffer from two things. One, Zero syndrome. They are characters born of JJK Zero. Meaning that they were born before the series itself was properly conceptualized, and thusly they had to be either white from the narrative or just couldn't be too important because Gage had very limited time to cook up in four chapters in one volume. 
thusly we're going to lose a lot of character interaction there. And two, the other major issue that they suffer from is, well, for lack of a better term, emptiness. Like, since we have so little time with these characters, since we have so little understanding of them, all of them end up feeling sort of resu not resoutly. Is it resoutly or resoutly? I think it's resoutly. I don't even think, that's not even the word I'm looking for, I don't think. They all end up feeling a bit hollow because all this stuff is interesting, but it's a lot of tell and don't show which is unfortunate considering the importance these two characters end up having and their relatively impressive performances against Tsukuda. Of course, more Miguel than LaRue, but still LaRue, you'll see LaRue cook. But with that being the case, we see Miguel hits the... Yes, I followed along because it was ghetto. And by babysitting Kotsu, I paid off all my dues for being let off the hook at Shinjuku. I don't have any or any stake left in that country. There's nothing it can do to offer me, and I've done everything in my power to pay back what was offered to me and what I did. So there's no point for me to engage with you or your people anymore. So tell me why I should. And it's good. And once again, it's that good reasoning. And this is admittedly something I can kind of not necessarily empathize with. Because once again, your boy's not a sorcerer. Nor did I have to raise somebody else's kid. Or, or like train a student. Anything like that. But I can definitely understand the idea of like, and I did my part. I did my part. I made my mistakes and then I paid off those mistakes. Like I, I've done everything in my power. Why would you want me to do more, especially for so little, when the main reason I was doing something is gone? Now, of course, like I said, like, a situation was nowhere near comparable, but I can definitely understand how Miguel's feeling here. And that's the impressive thing, right? That's the most impressive thing about Gage's writing. In spite of these characters feeling hollow, in spite of me not understanding why Miguel followed Ghetto, whether it be to, like, I don't know, inequality in his own nation, or want for other people to feel unique or special, anything like that, I have no idea... I can still understand how the character is feeling, which is impressive and important because if it really truly was purely tell, straight text with no interpretation, no image, no nothing, then I'd feel even more hollow than I do now. But this helps it. This level of connection through my understanding of Miguel's points here works to bolster the investment in the character and how the character makes it feel, which is impressive. And we see LaRue go on to answer the proverbial question that Miguel ended up asking. What can I do? What do you want me to do? What is my place in this whole game, especially after I lost the main reason I was playing? Essentially, it's asking, why do I keep playing chess after I've already been checkmated? You don't. Game's over. We see that LaRue says, we all loved sukuru -chan. You and me, Nanako, Mimiko, Toshiya, Monami, everyone. And once again, I only know two of those characters. I'm assuming Minami is the girl reporter and Toshish Toshishisha or whatever his name is. I'm assuming that was the nin ninja looking guy. But outside of that, I don't know anything about these characters. But we see Miguel say, ultimately, hmm, you're saying you should take everyone for what? You should take revenge for every ah English. You're saying we should take revenge for what happened in Shinjuku. No, not in Shinjuku, in Shabuya. Or we should take back Ghetto's body from Kenjaku. Now, it's about us mourning together. The way, the same way people would usually visit the grave, share a meal, and then wave goodbye. We'll blast the Requiem to the heavens by giving this all an offer. Giving this all? Giving our all in this fight. Which is... I mean, it's nice, and it, and it does make sense, once again. And I do think this does kind of soft-confirm both of them got hit by Maximum Meteor, because Miguel does bring up the fact that what happened in Shibuya, and what happened in Shibuya was the cleaves for Nanako and Mimiko, or the dismantles, most likely. And then, well, uh, well, we know. Well, actually, we don't know. That's the thing. We don't know what happened to those other two. I'm assuming it was the Maximum Meteor, though, because that's the first time we've seen them in the main series. I think the last time we've seen them in the main series. But with that being the case, the rule is essentially just telling Miguel... You're right. I got nothing really here to convince you. There's nothing tangible here. There's nothing proper here. 
But essentially, he's asking for Miguel to come along. Essentially, out of a sense of respect and a way to properly say goodbye and wave off the man who guided them. Which is a nice angle to take it from. Once again, I think they could have kept throwing logic bombs at Miguel all day. They could have been like, the whole crew's gonna get got, the world's gonna get got, everything will perish, this, that, and the other. And I think Miguel would have killed just been like, eh, 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 whatever, I don't really care. But by tying that emotional connection into it, by convincing Miguel to come risk his life for that, I think it works. I think it works a whole lot. And honestly, it allows for... I'm not going to say a... It doesn't allow for a filling. It does not allow for a filling of all the context here. But it does say a lot about Miguel's character. That it was not the logic. It was not any of that that convinced Miguel to come and lay it all bare. Leave it all behind on the battlefield of Roman Tsukune. It was simply the connections he had with people. He's still emotionally tied to these individuals deep enough that he is genuinely willing to risk his life for them. And I do like that. However, another thing I do like, I keep saying I like things about Miguel's character. And that's the thing, this chapter is a bunch of Miguel character work, which I do appreciate. Miguel goes quiet. And he says something very intriguing. Miguel asks, surely you mean the underworld? Because of course... <laughs> <laughs> they assume that all, well, they're not all sorcerers, but at least Suguru Geto, he ain't seeing them pearly gates. And honestly, with what we know now, at least somewhat of Gojo Satoru's afterlife, and the fact that Suguru Geto, if that is to be real, and that wasn't just a visualization of Satoru Gojo's own memories or beliefs or anything, then, then yeah, yeah, if, if not the underworld, then an airport. And I wouldn't say the airport is heaven. But with that being the case, we see that Miguel... He considers it. He has a moment of reflection. And then he's just like, oh, can't believe I'm doing this. But fine. I have conditions. I'm not serving my head on a plaza to someone who can use their domain expansion. We'll only fight that the Gojo Santoro and the Kotsuyuta have lost and Sukuno's domain is inoperable. So, Ghetto did get convinced. Once again, I do like that he was convinced by the emotional ties. By the proper connections that he ended up having to Suguru Geto, and that it isn't really that he's just fighting for the sake of the world. He isn't even fighting for his actual brothers and sisters. No, he's specifically fighting in order to pay homage, in order to pay respect, in order to lay down the gauntlet one last time, and for all the other things too. It's complicated. It's complicated, and I like that. That's the that's the beautiful thing about these characters in spite of their lack of time in spite of their lack of establishment in spite of everything that they don't have what they do have even if it owns through hints and subtexts and little expressions and tiny panels and hints of peak characterization hints of peak connections hints of peak it's a little bit of peak and a little bit of peak can go a long way and those are good conditions though admittedly it does make you wonder what would happen if he joined earlier like, hypothetically, during the Higuruma confrontation. But at the same time, I understand why they waited as long as they did. Because, like, yeah, they're going to be the last, last resort. Miguel, while he's willing to put his life on the line, he still isn't willing to throw it all away. He's not going to be out there first with Kashimo trying to box. He will wait after the two strongest have risked it all. <laughs> and after they fell, then fine. Who else is really there meant to fight? Honestly, it's impressive that he even let Maki pull up. He even let Kusakabe pull up. He was like, eh, I'll let y'all go too. Y'all seem, y'all seem swole enough. And then he finally pulls up. And I do like that he does immediately implicate we. He says, we're going to fight. And LaRue immediately is like, we? I'm fighting too? <laughs> you're, you're going to put me out on the battlefield? And the girl's like, really? Did, did, did you think you were free of this? But no, he doesn't just say that. He says, the more friends, the better. And yeah. If you're going to go out, go out with the people you believe in. The people you have faith in. The people who you do it all for in the first place, right? Especially considering what LaRue himself said. This is not meant to be some sort of solo effort. This is not some unanimous stand against the king coming from Soli Miguel. This isn't anything for even the sake of the world or anything like that. That's all too large scale. That's all too impersonal. That's all too irrelevant. What this truly is, is but respect. Respect being laid out for a man who once gave Miguel hope. And it's a way to send him off proper. So, of course, why wouldn't LaRue be implicated? 
they're going to fight together. Because if they're going to fall, they're going to fall together. And ultimately, Miguel's saying exactly what Captain America said. Except unlike <laughs> Captain America, Miguel actually meant it when he said, we'll go through it together. Captain America, he said, we'll lose together too, but they didn't lose together. But what that be in the case? We see that they now look and bear witness to the one who is free. But not actually free. The one who decided to possibly leave it all behind. Except he didn't leave it all behind. The one who stands there broken, torn down, and sparking. Ryoman Sukuna. Looking kind of funny in this image. I do like that he's sticking. At least it seems more consistent. That we're consistently going with Sukuna having the double pectorals. Like, I think Gege keeps flipping back and forth between the design. But I do think the double pectorals works well. Honestly, it's funny, because Sukuna... Well, no, not Sukuna. Because Forearms, another Forearm character from a very popular series in Ben 10, does not have the double pectorals, at least from what I remember, and he looks fine. But I think the way Sukuna is drawn, at least bare-shirted, giving him the double pectorals and not just, like, the super long abdomen works really, really well. Though, admittedly, the layering seems a bit weird here. It's, like, it implies that, like, his lower shoulders are, like, like sticking out of the front of his ribs and not, like, out of the side. But still, lower pectorals, they'll end up being like that unless you make the pectorals super broad down low. So, we see that Miguel and Su Miguel and the Rue are impressed. <laughs> it seems like his domain is properly sealed. I see. I see. Look at you go to Santoru, doing things even beyond the grave. And we see LaRue even mentions, Seems like Gojo has left us a gift before he passed. On top of his reverse curse technique being weakened, he's missing his lower left arm. And he isn't suited for battle anymore. Or the lower right isn't suited for battle anymore. And that is true. Once again, this is the weakest Sukuna, as they point out. And an unhealed heart. So yeah, Sukuna, he, he definitely won't do it right now. But once again, it goes to show just how powerful Sukuna is. That even with this, I don't think there's a single person in the fandom that believes he can still easily lose. Like, I think most people would be fine with it at this point. Like, if Sukuna were to lose, as he were in this chapter, I think nobody would exactly be angry with it, because, like, fine, you gotta move on at some point. But at the same time, he's still so powerful. Like, that that goes to show the levels. And I do think that's important, right? Like, especially a lot of people have been worried about Sukuna and his betrayal, and especially with certain characters surviving what they do survive, and certain characters possibly surviving what they may survive, especially in this chapter. A lot of people are definitively worried about Sukuna's representation and reputa reputation as King of Curses, strongest sorcerer in the series. But I do think his narrative and his positioning in the power scale is well upheld. I don't think Gage is necessarily contradicting anything. He's beaten the brakes off of Sukuna with everything that he could have. He threw Yuta at him. He threw Yuji at him. He threw Higuruma at him. He threw Kusakabe. He threw everything at the wall <laughs> to make Sukuna being this weak actually make sense and actually be tangible. So I do think it's fine. Because I've seen people complaining, like, Sukuna shouldn't be this weak. I think it's fine. Because not only is all that the case, not only does he not have an unhealed heart, missing two arms, extremely damaged, missing a lower tongue, missing even parts of his upper mouth, all that, but he's still holding back. Like, we see it verbatim against Maki. If he wanted to end it, he would. But he doesn't want to end it. So he's enjoying himself. He's still savoring it. Because once again, it's a big reason why I'm iffy on merger happening. Once it's all over, even Tsukuno will have little to nothing left to deal with or to do or interact with. He won't have a person, he'll have Tengen. And Tengen's even remotely sentient, which they most likely won't be, considering they're going to be a conglomeration of literally millions of souls. He's not going to really have a person or a technique to properly interact with. So it makes sense that Tsukuno's taking his time, savoring this final meal. Essentially, it kind of is the last thing Tsukuno's going to have a taste of before the merger. So he's going to savor it. He's going to drag it out. He's going to enjoy himself. Which I think is nice. I think, once again... It does add layers of Sukuna's character, but I know, considering he's going to lose because he's holding back, because he didn't just op and drop everybody, because he didn't just destroy everything, I know some people are going to be mad. And even then, I'll, I'll agree, I'll agree. Realistically, in Sukuna's situation, especially considering how close I am, without any easy way... I mean, he hits a Black Flash later, but without any easy way to restore my body, to restore my flesh, with that one, one up, rest wasted, there's nothing left, I'm kind of in a dire strait. Yeah, does it make sense for Sukuna to still be risking it all? Not really. But at the same time, we aren't Sukuna. 
We are the ones with that level of power, that level of transcendence. So, of course, he'd view this entire conflict, this entire battlefield, this entire world and the stake he has in it completely differently. And I do like that. It goes to show the inhumanity of Sukuna, which is something that I do think Gege's playing into a whole lot more. We started to tackle it. We drizzled a little bit in it in, like, 246 when... Or Ume first brought up the inhumanity of Hakari and the humanity of a lot of other sorcerers and how that holds them back. I do like how, through this, it's not being stated directly, but you can tell by Sugan's actions, his mentality, how he's approaching the battle, in spite of his damage, in spite of his wounds, in spite of being left in this horrid position, that he's still fighting the way he is. That he's not going all out. That he hasn't opened a box. That he hasn't tried to go for more Black Flash or Swords or CT output. That he hasn't done anything else but keep on fighting, keep on giving out his love, because ultimately, he's not like any of the other sorcerers here. He's even more transcendent in a way than Maki is, than Gojo was, than all these characters are. Because he views the world fundamentally differently. He views his life fundamentally differently. As he says himself, all he's doing is savoring the tastes of different people before eventually he himself faces the end. He knows that, despite being free of the system in many ways, despite being the pinnacle of the system in many ways, he's still bound by it. And I think that still makes Sukuna more and more interesting. Is he the most interesting character ever? Nah, kinda. But, not necessarily for me, but I still see... Sukuna's potential and his character interaction still being able to evolve and his character to be able to develop from this point forward. However, with that being the case, we see that Miguel grins in the room even and says, I almost feel bad. They saved us the most delicious part. And essentially, a super weak Sukuna is the most delicious part. Once again, I don't know what ha what happens here. What causes the building to collapse? Though, I do think it is Sukuna. I think it is Sukuna throwing out a dismantle at them. Because I think he heard them. Because, like, no, look at Sukuna's reaction here. He's rather blasé. He's rather calm. Within the moment, they make this claim and they smile in his face. That, oh, he's so weak. He's worn down so much. Oh, he's he's just for us. A nice, delicious little morsel. Sukuna's eyes widen. He tweaks out a little bit and the whole building gets destroyed. And considering LaRue's... Heart catch hand likely does not have this kind of destructive potency, and we know Miguel Signy doesn't have this kind of destructive potency. I'm assuming Sukuna just he just threw a whole dismantle at them for daring to believe that they of all people stood a chance. And just like considering Suku well, I, I don't know why I struggle to say Sukuna there. Sukuna does not know these characters. He has no idea for their potential or their capabilities, and them believing that oh, it's sweet now? I'm dessert now? They look, I'm the most delicious part. Hey, I'm the only one eating around here. So him crashing out a little bit does make sense. However, both LaRue and Miguel do manage to dodge and avoid that entire scenario. And as creation begins to fall apart behind them, LaRue is forced to engage Sukuna in the 1v1. LaRue goes for a high five and sends out the hand. This hand does tag Sukuna, but once again, I said it before and I'll say it again, it's reiterating. It's laying on the fact that Sukuna is still messing around. He's still playing around. He's still having himself a jolly old time messing around with the kiddos of the era. Because I don't think I need to convince you that there's no universe where Sukuna would actually get tagged by this if he was going remotely seriously. Unless you want to look me directly in my eyes and tell me that this mystical magical hand is faster than Maki's head. <laughs> And her perception, which he perception blitzed when he dragged her out of building. In this state, remember. Kusakabe did light damage, but th this Sukuna is essentially the same Sukuna that Maki had to fight. Maybe a tiny bit weaker. He's not this slow. But he got tagged by it. He's willing to interact with these techniques. And I think that's a big thing about Sukuna, too. It's honestly... I'm not going to say he's kind of a freak, but he is a little bit freaky. He is kind of, he's a little bit of a freak when you think about it. Because he's been allowing himself to get hit by a lot of stuff he did not need to get hit by. Like, all the way back to Higuruma's sword. He didn't have to chop off his own hand to deal with Higuruma's sword. But he did. When he could have easily just moved his hand out of the way. He was willing to engage with Yuta's domain and face Tank Jacob's ladder. Admittedly, that was under much more duress, but he did. We see he's willing to do weird things in terms of, like, taking damage and taking hits when he really doesn't have to. So Sukuna, he, he may be, I'm not going to say he's into it, but I'm not actually going to say he's not into it. I think he, I think he lands with it rocks with a little bit. I think he likes it. But with it being the case, we see him get slammed into this wall. But notably, look how the hand, one, seems way bigger, and two, immediately vanishes. 
and we see the damage actually gets reflected on LaRue, split straight down the middle. And Sugata does say, here's two for flinching, and smacks LaRue in the gut with a dismantle as Miguel dashes in. So we see the hand was torn apart. So, multiple things here. One, LaRue, not the worst kind of technique, but actually, no, I'll, I'll save it, because they do go over LaRue's technique, and I do want to talk about it, it's hypothetical potential. But... LaRue does seem to eat a dismantle here, relatively no issue. They do keep fighting. You can tell it's a dismantle based on the arm motion, an arm motion that's mirrored when Sugata uses the dismantle later on in this chapter, and the fact that, you know, it, it seems like a slash motion that seems to go across LaRue's gut here. But then Miguel's the one who charges in, and we see Sukuna versus Miguel begin. Now, first things first, because people, people said, oh, you're downplaying Miguel. Am I? Am I? Because, like... It all goes back, and I don't know. Once again, now I see more discourse on it. Dismantle speeds. Dismantle perception. Dismantle, dismantle. What does it all mean? That's a good question. I actually don't know. So, the thing here is, right? At a base level, if you assume all dismantles are uniform, and you assume Miguel cannot perceive them, the fact that he's just using the beat that comes from his own body, by the way, to guide himself to dodge through this multiple, sometimes overlapping array of dismantles from Yom Tsukuna. Insanely impressive. He joins Maki, who does it through precognition and extrasensory perception that no one else in the entire verse has. Kusakabe, who abused simple domain hacks to nerf the dismantles as they got to him, and then domain hacks to auto-respond to the dismantles as they get, became to reach him, and possibly Gojo Santu, who at least somewhat was able to kind of sort of perceive a dismantle that came towards him. Miguel just does it. Raw. And if they're all the same speed, this is Buku Bonkers. It basically goes into the same thing I said about Maki, where basically nothing any of our other cast can do should be able to hit Miguel. Unless it's actually a sure hit from a domain expansion. If you assume dismantle speeds are uniform. If that's the case, Miguel is arguably with this. And his curse technique, which is active at this point. I keep saying characters are like top 5 fastest. But like outside of Gojo, Sukuna. And we know Sukuna can blitz his own dismantle. We've seen this before. Once again, he's able to blitz Maki through her precog when she's able to react to world slashes. So presumably... It's very likely that Sukuna is still above his own attack speed. We know dismantles are extremely fast. I think the only characters who you can definitively say are likely above Miguel in terms of combat and reaction speed are characters like Curse Noia. Maybe, once again, maybe Maki. Because this is still very impressive because Maki has precog. While well, Miguel isn't implied to have precog, he's just dodging them and dealing with them. And we don't know the effective debuff range of Miguel's technique. So who knows? These may be full speed dismantles that are just weaker in terms of output because Sugan's output is in the garbage. And he just dodges and bobs through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine whole dismantles. He weaves through, and even on top of that, he completely dodges one of Sukuna's kicks. And now, of course, there are ways to wink this to the moon, to oblivion. Because since we know Sukuna can perception, well, not perception blitz, but kind of, perception blitz someone who can perceive his own and precog his own techniques, the fact that Miguel's able to dodge a kick from Sukuna here is very, very impressive. If you assume Sukuna's going all out and tweaking out like he was tweaking out against Maki. Is he doing that, though? I don't know. And that's... It's the ever-present, ever-continuous nightmare. One, you have to make a big assumption about dismantles. That they're all uniform in speed, and their output does not vary. Or the amount of output they have does not vary their speed at all. You have to assume that. Which is fine. I mean, assumptions are assumptions. We don't have enough explanation for dismantles. But also, Sukuna's mood. And how playful he is, versus him tweaking out. I think the only characters he's taken remotely seriously... Or Yuta, because he had to. He had to lock in. He literally had to risk his life to hit Yuta with a world splitting dismantle. So Yuta's up there. Maki, he tweaks out on, but I won't even say that's taking her seriously. That's just tweaking out on her and trying to perception blitz her. For daring to think that the body and the flesh is as good as sorcery. And Kashimo, who he tweaked out on slightly and hit him with a whole proper dismantle net, not just dismantle streams like he does against Miguel here, out of respect and a show of love for Kashimo. So, it's hard to really give Miguel credit unless you make an assumption about dismantles. Because I'd love to give him credit for dodging Sukuna here, but characters have reacted and dodged Sukuna before while Sukuna's holding back. And Sukuna's holding back meter 
can vary massively. It's no, there's no consistency, and that's the unfortunate thing about this. It's it's hard. It's very very difficult to scale anything off of this. Highest in interpretation, Miguel is one of the fastest characters in the verse, with no precog, with no perception, maybe with just some minor technique weakening of other things and technique strengthening. Good stuff. Good stuff. Lower end of this, still gonna totally back a whole bunch. But I don't think you can go too low because dodging the dismantles when characters like Unicorn does it. But then again, that's the thing. This is such a weak Sukuna. But if you think dismantle speeds are uniform, then it doesn't really matter. He's dodging dismantles. Nine of them. So, and from relatively close range too. Like, look at the look at the spawn point of these dismantles, or at least what should be the spawn point. He's about, like, right here, if Sukuna's arm were to be fully extended this way, he's about an arm's length away from Sukuna. So these dismantles are coming from really, really close, too. And he's still able to dodge and weave them all. Like, they're still right on top of each other when these dismantles get launched out. So, very, very impressive. Like, notably, these are closer ranges than what Kusakabe and Maki were dodging from. When Maki dodged, or just... Di well, actually, no. She does... There's, there's some extremely close range stuff at the start of 253. But still... Regardless, it's still very, very impressive. I don't see many characters doing this, so Miguel is still definitely up there. How low you can take it... Eh, I'm not sure because it got be level, I guess. That's how low you can go. But regardless, we see that Tsukuna kicks the boulder away. And LaRue is forced to use their curse technique on themselves to dodge the boulder that would have absolutely patty caked their head. And we get an explanation of LaRue's technique. LaRue's technique, hard catch, can grip the technique's target. Even if destroyed, the illusory hand can be reinstalled an infinite number of times. With only one-tenth of the damage being transferred back to LaRue's own body. Which is interesting. That's a pretty solid technique. It's telekinesis with a bit of a cost and a visual indicator, but telekinesis with a cost and a visual indicator ain't that bad. Like, it's pretty solid, honestly. And the utilizations for it are impressive. The ability to use it on yourself, to use it on others, and hypothetically use it as a defensive technique, which may be hinted at later on. And the fact that you only take a tenth of the damage that the hand takes... That's good stuff. Now, hypothetically, if someone were to multiply their attack that would one-shot you by that attack that would one-shot you, and half of that attack that would one-shot you, even if you reduce that to a tenth of its potency, it would probably still one-shot you. But, regardless, that's a pretty good technique. It essentially means LaRue never actually has to actively engage with his opponent if he can move the hand well enough. So, I'd say that's a probably, it's not the craziest technique, I wouldn't say it's an A-tier technique, but that's probably like a high B-tier, probably a really high B-tier, only inferior to like techniques with more utility or more diversity or more like immediate danger to them. So good stuff, good stuff. And we see that Sukuna, once again, it's super hard to determine anything scaling-wise because of the mood, look at the smile, look at the playfulness, look at all this. Sukuna says, <clears throat> No particularly interesting flavors from that technique. If there's any promise here, it'll be from Miguel. As we finally get an explanation of Miguel's technique and an explanation on why he was able to do so well against Ogozo Satoru that year ago. Miguel Undung's cursed technique, Hakuna Lana. The beat etched by his body expels curses and enhances his own physical capabilities. And his siblings describe it as, Miguel's technique is like shooting off buffs and debuffs without the use of it on men. Sure, it's not exactly useful, but not exactly scary. So, that's the thing. Miguel's technique is a nebulous buff and debuff sort of mimicking the effects of the domain without the effects of the domain. So, while Kusakabe had to activate Simple Domain to get the auto-dodge effects and stuff like that, and he does have different perks that Miguel doesn't have, likely like Simple Domain, auto-attack, and auto-defense, this is still pretty solid. Of course, we run into the issue of, like, how much do it do to How do the debuffs work? Like, for the slash dodging earlier, are those full-speed dismantles while they're under the effect of Miguel's technique? Does Miguel's technique even affect them? Because notably, it's described as the beat etched by his body. Hold on, let me see. Etched by his body. Not necessarily released by his body. I'm not sure if he's making sound. That's the thing. I'm not sure if it's the beat he's making by dancing and what rhythm he's producing that causes that and whatever the sound that is released from that interacts with has the debuff and buffing effect or if he's just consistently producing a sound. I'm pretty sure etched just means like built into. Hold on etched definition come to me show me the definition of etched made okay etching not edging etching a print produced in the process of etching the art process of producing etched plates what etch engrave yeah engrave metal glass or stone by coating it with a protective layer drawing it with a needle and then covering it with acid to attack parts the needle has exposed especially in order to produce prints from it so yeah 
I'm not sure how Miguel's technique works. This will be something that's going to be much better conveyed when the anime comes out, because it would make sense to kind of do the domain comparison if the technique Miguel produces is, like, actually genuine. But then again, we... Well, Gage didn't tell JDK Zero staff, so I highly doubt they knew. But is he producing a sound? And if he's producing a sound consistently is that the effective area of his technique where he's getting the buffs from it and then the debuffs are applying to every technique in his general radius that is also subject to the sound kind of like a consistent aoe effect of cursed speech except it doesn't have any sort of specific commands other than make things weaker and make make curses that do not affect miguel weaker while the curse that miguel use makes himself stronger or what i don't no, if it's something he consistently produces, if it's something entirely internal, if it's something that he needs to do through the motion, because notably he never stops moving. I'm not, sh I don't think he's dodging dismantles here. He's still just dancing. So I don't know. Something I'm more excited to see explain over time, because right now it does seem a teeny tiny bit vague. However, with that being the case, we see that this explanation. Oh, okay. So this actually didn't come. I did. How did I not realize this? This is Gojo speaking. This isn't actually Miguel's family, presumably, because this is the transition of this conversation. <clears throat> Miguel's technique is like shooting off buffs and debuffs without the use of a domain. Sure, it's useful, but not exactly scary. And Miguel naturally asks, "Hey, how do you know my curse technique?" That's the that's the thing that I can't say in that accent. Curse technique just does not roll off the tongue well, at least in that accent for me. But we see that Gojo says, "I can tell just by looking at you." Now. The real frightening thing is that build. <laughs> but I, I do like how Miguel does find that scary and concerning, because likely he doesn't know about the six eyes. Because the six eyes is what allow Gojo to break down techniques more fundamentally. And considering he did have an entire extensive battle with Miguel a year ago at this point in the timeline, it's likely he did get a full display of Miguel's technique. But with it being the case, Gojo goes on a little bit of a, a certain ology rant, a certain pseudoscience rant, where he says, 99% of all sorcerers are Japanese. I had a cursed energy buff to the... These guys' physiques and muscle mass, which are crazy rare in Japan, and the results are pretty menacing. And here's the thing about what Gojo's referencing. I've seen people try to defend it by saying, like, what? He's right. But, he, like, he isn't. That's, I'm not, I'll, I'll say it. It's phrenology, which you can look it up. It's a pseudoscience with no actual scientific backing. Because once again, we as humans are 99.9% .9 the same. There are slight mutations and differences that come across in stuff like this. That's it. There are extre like there are exceptions to every single species in broad amounts. There are extremely tall people in races that typically don't have tall people and extremely short people in races that typically don't have short people. We're the same, for the most part. There are minor differences, like our hair textures and our skin tones and certain things and like our palates and our resistances to certain environmental aspects but we're mostly the same which is why i'm kind of proud of miguel for coming out and being like you're painting quite a broad brush that's a bit uh, insensitive you know i'm not special because i'm black i'm special because i'm me which is true notably look at your boy i am not that strong <laughs> like this is all this is all i got this is all I got. i'm not miguel <laughs> you could give me curse energy and above and it wouldn't be all too crazy and notably, we know for a fact that the strongest sorcerer in history, or at least the one with the highest output, was born in Japan. You could give a million Miguel's cursed energy and crazy stuff, but the output was determined at birth. There wasn't going to be much of a buff. <laughs> and while, don't get me wrong, it is a true fact of the universe that your base physicals do seem to play some sort of role in how far you can take your cursed energy reinforcement, it isn't actually consistent. Because look at Yuta. Yuta, who's someone who's physically weak, has some of the best strength feats on the strongest Sukuna. Or one of the strongest Sukunas. Remember, Yuta just does punch Miguel's, not Miguel, Sukuna's stomach and make him draw juice. Miguel, who supposedly, according to Gojo here, is stronger than him physically, didn't do that. Even though he has Curse Injury Reinforcement and a stronger base than Yuta. So, like... Your reinforcement doesn't necessarily do all too much. And the base differences in physiques normally come to just a difference in training and physical refinement and stuff like that. So Miguel is physically refined. 
But that's because, as Miguel says, it's because he's Miguel, not necessarily because of his ethnicity, which I think is important to bring up. And like I said, I don't think this actually does anything bad for Gojo's character. It's just an antiquated view from a guy from an old Japanese family. This isn't surprising. Gojo is old money, came from old money, came from a very antiquated system, which very likely be believed in an old thing like phrenology, which is confirmed to be a pseudoscience. It's not bad. It, it is just something that is there. That is added. Does it necessarily need to be there? Eh, not necessarily. But once again, I do think it adds a little bit to the world building. It reinstates certain ideas. It's kind of like how Gege didn't necessarily have to tackle the whole bias against women thing that Japan typically has. Or the bias in the criminal system that Japan typically has. Through Higuruma, through Mai and Maki. And just the general way certain people are treated based on how they conflict with the higher-ups. Or older generations in Japan, like he did with Akari, but he did it anyway, because of the world building. So this, even if it comes through Gojo Santoru and knocking his knees out with his character, I think it is nice, because it once again adds to more world building, which JJK desperately needs. And regardless, Gojo does apologize, as he says, oh, my bad. And Miguel does just write it off, whatever. Which, it does come down to that. Miguel just corrected Gojo on pseudoscience. That's okay. <laughs> I do find it extra funny, though, because, like, Gojo's the one person in the world who should be able to read it all in the six signs, but it goes to show, once again, Gojo's still, one, a product of his environment, which makes sense. And it's this kind of thing is even hinted at earlier when Yuta talks about the only people who believe something like that or stereotypes like this are people who grew up on old movies. Someone like Satoru Gojo. But, with that being the case, because remember, Gojo, I think he is actually born? Because the series takes place in 2018. And Gojo's, I believe, 28. So... He would have been born around the 90s. And probably did grow up on, like, old 80s movies and 90s movies. Which, you have those stereotypes. But, with that being the case, we do get to see that Yuta Kotsu does get caught up on a particular point. As he's like, when you say frightening, does that apply to you, Gojo-sensei? And Gojo does explain... Uh, hmm, I'm not sure if this will make sense, but if Miguel and I were to fight a battle, knuckle with, bare knuckle, with only cursed energy enhancement and no techniques, then I'd win the marathon, but he the sprint. Essentially, Miguel, he's, he, I mean, that's the weird thing, though. It implies that they're comparable in physicals with just reinforcement, and what Gojo has over Miguel is stamina. And maybe a slight advantage in strength. Because typically when you're comparing a sprinter or any long distance runner, if you're going to put one in a race, then if you it's a shorter race, you want the sprinter because they're typically faster than the long distance runner over a short period, while vice versa occurs where the long distance runner has more conditioning and more stamina for a long distance run, even if they would run the distance technically shorter than the sprinter would do if they could actually run that full distance. So for this comparison, I'm assuming it means that Miguel has either direct equivalence to Santo de Gojo in terms of physical ability without any curse technique enhancements, meaning without blue, without red amping and anything like that, and ultimately, what would give Gojo the edge overall isn't just his more offensive and useful technique, but also his longevity that's born of the six eyes and his natural strictness and perfection of cursed energy efficiency. Which is interesting. That gives Miguel very, very high praise, considering Gojo's implied to have some of the best physicals in the verse. Of course, he falls short to characters most likely like Ryu. I assume in just terms of regular base physicals reinforcement because of Ryu's highest output statement and Sukuna's respect to that highest output saying he's still the toughest guy out there, not bringing up Gojo, but very specifically bringing up Ryu. But still, Miguel having that high of a stats, oh, that may just knock him up a couple spots in spite of what his feats go on to argue against. Because here, the thing is, we see Sukuna has this interaction with Miguel, right? He grabs his wrist, drags Sukuna's arm away, knocks the other hand that Sukuna goes to slash him with away, and then lands a solid strike straight to Sukuna's either his upper tummy mouth or damaged heart. But remember, this is an even weaker Sukuna than the one that Yuta was fighting. And then when Yuta punched a completely fine tummy mouth, it also spat up blood. So for someone who's supposedly on the level of Sasuke Gojo with physical reinforcement, for Yuta to have a comparable feat with his punches, 
kind of weird, I will admit. I don't know. I feel like Gege meant to have Miguel do more, but you kind of can't have Miguel do too much more in spite of what the statement implies for his physicals, which is unfortunate, but I, I mean, it'd be like that when it'd be like that, especially when it'd be like that. I still think this is a solid enough display of Miguel's relativity to Gojo, at least in terms of a combat sense and combat skill sense. Though I do ultimately think the rougher translation I saw where essentially Gojo's better defensively while Miguel's better offensively would have been a smoother transition than this but regardless we see miguel keeps on the pressure he even drops an elbow straight into suguna's chest but once again i want to pay specific highlight to suguna's face his general disinterest and the overall lack of damage in spite of miguel attacking a very clear vital point and notably suguna is clearly not bound by miguel like the moment he senses choso here about to hit him with a piercing blood from a specific angle he easily dodges out of the way and then Miguel doesn't put his hands on him at all later on in this chapter. So, while it is impressive that Miguel, one, never gets tagged by Sukuna, two, is able to redirect Sukuna, and three, is able to damage Sukuna in his damaged parts with his strikes and even move Sukuna around a little bit, it still doesn't really make me believe that Miguel has any real solid scaling to Sukuna, even with his physicals and his cursing decamping him, and hypothetically even debuffing Sukuna. Which is unfortunate, but still, makes sense. Sukuna still is supposed to be that powerful. And we see him perfectly weave this piercing blood from Chosa. Which is so unfortunate. Why do I have to do my boy like this? Joseph, fight back! But with that being the case, we see that Sukuna also throws a slash out of Choso, but Choso does block it. And rather than taking serious damage, he more so goes, Pfft, like he's annoyed with it. And that's why I do believe that LaRue also gets smacked by a dismantle here, because it's the same arm swinging motion and the slash across the guy. But with that being the case, we see that someone drops in! Hits him with that. Bah! And it's Yuji Itadori slamming down through the roof of the building, by the way. He he really decided to be extra with it. Slamming through the roof and down on Ryo Mitsukuna. Once again, it comes to the question of, is this blood? Are these little splatters here meant to be blood? And if so, from what? Are these from Sukuna's arms? Does Yuji Itadori actually manage to draw blood from Sukuna's arms with this double sledgehammer impact? If so... Okay, Mr. Itadori, I was not familiar with your game. I see the vision. But if not... Okay, Mr. Itadori, I see your game. I was not familiar with the vision. Because he does do a couple things here. Remember, Sukuna has his own variation of precog. Or at least, he has some similar level of perception to the Heavenly Restriction users. This is confirmed by his ability to hop off air and his ability to read through a lot of specifically weird attacks that he shouldn't be able to read through without some variation of precog. If you remember way back when, in chapter, I believe, 233, or 232 when Gojo did the whole Killua thing and was like speed walking around him he easily read which one was the real one and he wasn't even looking at the real one he just put his hand back blocked it then turned and looked we see he's able to react to and dodge blues before they actually even appear we see he's able to read Choso's presence so admittedly that could be because of Choso's cursed energy but regardless he's shown some variation of precog himself and crazy reaction speed so the fact that Yuji is not only able to break through the roof make all that noise and tag Sukuna anyway but also force Sukuna to block with both of his arms and also be forced into the ground nearly into a kneel by Yuji very impressive for my boy. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm straight up proud of my boy for being able to do something this crazy, this next level. Though, admittedly, Sukuna just immediately discredits the feats by asking, Really? You're still around? Which is so disrespectful. But I think at this point, it is just out of petty and spite. He, he, Yuji Isidori could tear both of his arms off. And Sukuna would be like, Mid, Maki do better. And <laughs> keep it pushing. But with that being the case, while it is cool to see my boy Yuji Itadori get his glaze up a little bit, get a nice little calm little feet, calm little feet, and notably Sukuna doesn't damage him this chapter because there's very little chapter left, we get a clarification, an explanation that has had the community up in a bit of a tizzy, a bit of a tizzy from what I've seen. <clears throat> in order to activate the brawn targeted world severing dismantle, the same hand sign used from a level tried. Enma 10 was required. However, the only, with only one arm remaining prior to his transformation, Sukuna was forced to impose a binding vow to the activation conditions for all preceding uses of the move in order to cut Gojo Santaru. Presently, on top of both Enma 10 hand signs and chance being required, the trajectory of the technique must be specified via his palm. 
I still think Palm is weird. I want to see what the official translation says on that. Because I don't... So, a couple things here. A couple things that are a little bit confusing. That this does raise up. I'll tackle the big thing that has the community, y'all. But the big thing that has a lot of the community... Is the fact that this does just imply it's going to cheat it. In a way. In a way. I think it's a system mechanic abuse, though. And I don't think system mechanic abuse counts as cheating. Using a binding vow in order to activate the technique the way he did when he did it, I just think that's, once again, Tsukuda Smash of Jujutsu showing. A lot of people have been getting mad at Tsukuda for this and, like, restarting the Tsukuda fraud allegations. But, like, y'all, he's a sorcerer. They're con artists. He just did the right play. If he could do it, he did, and it worked out. I can't knock his hustle. Because I should have dodged it. <laughs> what can I say? But, with that being the case, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that, and I even am glad that that's finally been explained on how he did it, because that's a big thing that's been a question in the community for months especially after he used it on Kashimo 238 how did he even do that against Gojo with seemingly no visual visual or audible chance no hand signs no pointing no nothing how did he whip out the world serving dismantle when every other time he's needed to point to aim it and chant and do all this how do he do it so first to be explained it was a binding vow nice I'll take it next thing Gojo's kind of helping out from beyond the grave again. At least from my interpretation of this, this is implying that if Sukuna didn't have to do all this to beat Satoru Gojo specifically, then he could just be spamming the world cutting dismantles. But no, because he had to put that binding vow on every following use, every preceding use, Sukuna needs these specific conditions to be met. The Enmaten, the chance, and the aiming. Which means, hypothetically, Sukuna got a massive debuff, inverse and crossverse, from having to do it the way he did. Because Sukuna essentially, without this, as long as he hit Malevolent Shrine Pose, because that seems to be a base requisite, right? Like, in order to activate the Broad World Severing Dismantle, the same hand sign for Malevolent Shrine and Maten was required. That seems like a flat line. All the extra conditions seems to be a result of the Binding Vow. So he still would have had to hit the... I don't know how to do the Enmaten hand sign, but... He still would have had to hit that, but if he could just stand there and start randomly spamming directionless world splitting dismantles, he would move up massively. Massively. But one question that does come from this, and I'll have to double check, and I'll probably make a video talking about it separately, because I'm not sure who may be, how many people are here all the way at this point. If you are, hi. I'm glad you are. But how did he use it against you to them with one hand? Like, notably, the Enmaten hand sign, specifically from Malevolent Shrine, it appears to be two-handed, and notably, that's why the loss of this other left arm is so important, right? Because he can't form that hand sign to do it, so I'm a little confused on how he used it on Yuta, because, like, he, he pointed with one, so what do you need to point with both? Unless, he may have, but the thing I'll excuse it for, and the reason why I won't put too much of this on it, is because there's a high likelihood he did this quickly off panel while he was chanting, and then he aimed it with the palm. That's the only way I'll rationalize it, because otherwise it kind of doesn't make sense. I don't know. Especially considering, at the time, he would have had to have used his upper set of arms, which were being restrained by Rika. So I'm assuming the order of events is, Sukuna uses cleave on the hands of Rika, Rika lets go from the pain. Sukuna very quickly claps his hands together to do Enmaten, chants as he does so with his upper mouth, and then aims, transitions to the shot we see where you get sliced in half. That's how I'll rationalize it, because if you just go by what we're shown, he shouldn't have been able to use World Splitting Dismantle there. He really shouldn't have. So we'll go with that. Though, other than that, that's very big. That's very big. It's a horrid nerf for Sukuna across verse, because now you would have to use like an alternative hypothetical Sukuna to imply that he could ever do the directionless world cutting dismantles. But what this does open up the door to is that the world slashing dismantles, they could be implemented into his domain. Because they use the same hand sign anyway, he'd probably just have to continuously chant, which would be insane. You wouldn't need to use cleave anymore. Just world swing dismantles would go insane. But the reason all this is brought up and explained is because a certain someone appears. As Sukuna managed to get all the way this far away from Miguel, a person appears and she takes that arm right off. Like butter. Like a hot knife through butter. Almost as if it ignores the conventional durability of all things. Hmm. I wonder what that could be. I wonder. We see 
Sukuna wasn't even paying attention. He was looking around somewhere else. And then he notices. And even he gives credit. As he says, even after eating a black flash. Maki-senpai, she's here. That's my goat. <sighs> feel like Xehanort right now. Yes. Now, one thing I will admit. One thing I will admit. I've had my freaking geek out sections and sessions in the other videos. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit the, that's my goal for the one time. For the two time and for the three time. That's my goal. That's my goal. That's my goal. But I'll admit, Sukuna's Black Flash must be garbage. <laughs> like, because remember, he very specifically turned off his RCT, focused super deep, was genuinely tweaking out, and was trying to prove a point against Maki. So the fact that Maki comes back with at most, maybe this is meant to be her blood, but I easily think this is meant to be Sukuna's because this is his arm falling off here. I think this could easily be Sukuna's blood. Maki essentially ate a black flash from Sukuna with no damage. That's insane. <laughs> like, from a somewhat serious Sukuna too. Unlike a lot of things where I can kind of like be like, oh, well, whatever. You know, Sukuna's probably not going all too, too all out. For him to hit a black flash, he has to be focused in the zone. He literally turned off his RCT, focused all his cursed energy into his fist to land that punch. And it did basically no damage. So while don't get me wrong, that's a fantastic durability feat for Maki. It does kind of downplay Sukuna's black flashes as a byproduct. That's the that's the trade-off that I'm kind of not too fond of. Because in order to give Maki that crazy feat, she basically had to devalue black flash. But then again, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Black Flash can be told to us that it's a 2.5 exponential multiplier all at once. It has never been portrayed that way. Never. Unless you want to imply everyone's way more bulky than it is. However, I made a loose claim that I was messing around with. Let me be clear. Let me, well, let me be clear. Yeah, well, this is a crazy durability feat. Maki was still taken out for an entire chapter and some nebulous dead time in between. So she did need direct time to recover from this, which implies that anything on the level of a Sukuna Black Flash would still incapacitate Maki. You would still win the fight against Maki. Sure, she survived and recovered, presumably off her own regeneration factor, considering Ui Ui, but like... Still, it's not, it's not all too crazy. She did get taken out of the battle by the Black Flash. It's just impressive that she managed to return that quickly with so little damage. So I'll give her credit! But if you're knocked out of a battle for five minutes... You're knocked out of a battle for five minutes. Like, you still lose. So, this isn't the craziest, but it still is crazy that she managed to eat that. Though, once again, I slandered her before, and I'll slander her again real quick. She should have taken more. She should have taken more. She really, really, really should have taken more. Whether it be taking an entire leg, whether it be taking more chunks of the arms, whether it be going for the other side, where he has a somewhat functioning hand back, should have taken that. She should have taken more. Because we know that once Sukuna has eyes on Maki, he's not going to let her go. So Maki giving up her advantage here and only taking a chunk of his forearm off rather than the whole thing or removing his head. I know the head wouldn't happen because it's not Maki's role, but removing a leg. There were so many better things Maki could have done with the fact that Sukuna had no idea where she was and was not expecting her to be there. So I'll say this. If Sukuna does anything with them arms or that leg or anything, Maki fumbled. I'll say it for a bit. Maki fumbled. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. She, 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 she messed up. I'm going to say that right here, right now. As a Maki meat muncher, hear me say it. If anything bad happens, if any more characters fall, if anything that could have been prevented by Sukuna either missing a leg or missing more of his arms, if he recovers real quickly after this by flat, if anything happens, it's all Maki. Because she really should have taken more than just this and i know this is still a lot like imagine you losing your forearm from this point on even if you could regenerate that's still big but there's so much more of sukuna she could have hit so many more vital points sukuna can't run if he doesn't have a leg you know what i'm saying but with that being the case we see that yuji gets his hopes up as he says she's here he can't complete the hand sign with only his right arms and his reverse curse technique still isn't functional. We can win. It's finally all coming together. Everyone's hard work. All for this moment. Yuji, my boy. Don't you know what they say? When things are looking up, you should always be prepared to look down. As we see, a black flash rings out, slamming LaRue. Now, a couple things here before I get into this final little bit and talk about this. 
we don't see the hand here. We don't see the hand. Because I've seen people saying, well, the whole reason the whole 10% of the damage gets transferred to the LaRue thing got introduced was very specifically so, you know, we could cover this and not have to worry about LaRue fully getting got because they block with a hand, right? I don't see it here. So LaRue should be cooked. They should be atomized from a Sukuna Black Flash. Even with his lowered output, considering what Sukuna was able to do to Maki. But, with that being the case, Sukuna hit another Black Flash. And the narrator brings up something interesting. Gojo Satoru recovered his lost reverse curse technique output by landing a second Black Flash. Now, in the King of Curses case, dot, dot, dot. This essentially verbatim implies that the king of... Wait a second. It's a pick your poison kind of thing. Because here's the thing, right? With this being set up the way it is, it either means A, we're going Sukuna. He's going to get something new. But at the same time, he doesn't need it. But it does mean he's not getting his RCT output back. Because why explain it like this? Why do the dot dot dot? The, that's, the, that's the questionnaire. That's the questionnaire that's essentially being laid here. What is he going to get back? I don't know. But I don't think it's his RCT output. I think he is going to get something new. Another thing. I... If he does get something new, I don't want to see it yet. I want to cut away. I want to cut away. This seems like a really vague, really ominous ender, which will be perfect for a cutaway. So I do want to cut away. That's my two main thing. But I want to talk about those more in depth in their own videos. I've been yapping for a bit. So if you somehow made it all the way to the end of this 10 out of 10 chapter and this thick, thicky boy review, please leave obsidian ashes obsidian ashes in the comment section down below as you thank you so much for watching if you do leave a like share comment and subscribe and make sure you hit that little bell so you know i sell on any videos that come to the channel also also i do have to have a patreon below where you can support me for as low as one kind of one dollars things like exclusive videos early content and more you'll also become a member of the channel for as low as three dollars a month to get the same perks and more some of those perks will include the 38 minute live reaction to this very chapter along with every variations of all my videos and if you want a $25 patron or a $25 member you can order whatever video you want now I do thank you so much for watching once again and I hope you guys have a wonderful day this is Dagger the Pencil writing off I'd like to give a thank you to our three lower members O'Connor Plays Greyhound Akids Void Astro Eternal Flame Teen Midgal Quarencia Tala and Red Wolf 4765. And I'd like to give a thank you to our $5 patrons Steron, Sean, Panda Goat, Midnight Lord 21, Marcus, Kevin, Igneal, and Ehak1. And I'd like to give another thank you to our $7 members Autumn's Mornings Lazo and Sick Addiction. And I'd like to give a hefty thank you to our $10 member Banana Phone. And I'd like to give a big old thank you to our $10 patrons, Joaquin, Jermaine, and Idem Okami. And I'd like to give a big gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, China Doll 9 And another big gargantuan, juicy, scrumdly, thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.